I was saying before, is just basically um, I'm just kind of at home today filling you know, some of my own boxes here, stuff for the spring, and I uh, thought this would be a good opportunity just to um, have do that in a more public way so you guys can actually just kind of watch uh, what I'm doing here. And um, you know, I'll maybe throw a few points and uh, thoughts here and there on what I'm doing. And, um, this is going to be an interactive thing, so if you guys want to ask questions as we go, by all means, uh, please feel free to do that. And, um, and yeah, we'll, we'll throw a few kind of core techniques and, and things and styles of tying these flies uh, so you guys can do it yourself. So like I said, there's no real structure that I'm going to do this. This is more just let's muck around and have some fun. So that might be I just started on some really simple stuff. So um, if you guys could just let me know in the chat if, uh, if you can hear me okay. Please do. I think my audio is all right. Um, yeah, so to start off, uh, one thing that we hear very frequently is that people don't want to have to invest in um, the super expensive saddles and fancy hackles and stuff. Perfect, thank you, Mark. I wasn't sure if I was just talking to dead air there or not. Um, so yeah, one, one thing that we hear a lot is that folks don't want to have to spend um, a whole lot of money on fancy hackles and things to tie dry flies. And it is um, a real um, restraint uh, with tying some of these patterns is that the, it starts the stream. So the initial cost of startup is, is fairly high. So, um, I'm going to start off with a few flies that I really like, that are really good fishing flies, but that are really just cheap and easy to tie and uh, make for a really good, um, I'd say, intro patterns of somebody that can start tying dry flies, but also just really effective fish catching flies. So we've shown this one on live streams before, but I think it's worth a second um, go around. So this is going to be a fly called Boom Tips, the same one I had on the vice there, with something like that. And basically I like a little fill more or less. Uh, it's an emerger pattern, it imitates a whole host of different things, um, and, uh, and it's really, a, a, I would say, a great prospecting pattern if you're not really sure uh, what's happening on the water. It seems to always kind of work. And the um, staple material in here, what really makes this thing work, is this stuff. And experienced tires probably know it. It's uh, CDC or Key to Canard which is um, a duck feather from uh, in around the butt of a duck. Um, it's got a lot of natural oils on it and uh, it's these really delicate fibers that uh, make it present really nice and delicately. It is an awesome material if you're going to tie dry flies. Whether or not you're just starting out, I would very highly recommend that you get some. It's what 90% of my dry flies are based on. Um, I use this stuff more than half of it, and it's a lot cheaper and easier to get your hands on generally. So this fly is really simple. Uh, if you have a really big feather, like I do here, this is a really nice full one, lots of fluff on it. It's gonna help this thing float uh, nice and high. If you had a smaller feather, something maybe a little sparser, maybe slightly beat up even like that. Let me see. Get out of here again. See just the difference in the number of fibers. I would always prefer use this, and uh, this I use more for dubbing, I just kind of Check these things almost. Um, these aren't, I would say, worth your time tying dry flies with. You want the big fluffy guys. Uh, but if you had to tie with the lower grade stuff, just use, uh, I would say, two, three feathers for this fly, depending on the size that you're tying with. I'm just going to use a single one because I've got a nice full thing. So I'm just going to bundle up the fibers into a pinch here. And the, the area where I've gotten in trouble with this before is getting too cute and trying to go too short on this thing. A longer wing is going to do you favors, both uh, in visibility and floatability. And it's not going to affect how the fish see it all that much. So I like to go with probably um, a shank and a quarter to so a shank and a half length here. And bring my thread almost up to the eye. This is a 14 knot uh, olive, by the way. Uh, so pretty thin stuff. And you'll see that pretty little all of my rise here are going to be tied with. Uh, pretty small diameter threads, 14 knot, 16 knot. It is way easier to tie that thin stuff than it is like an 8 knot or 6 or even a 10 or 12 knot. Um, it, those threads just tend to bulk up a little too quickly, my liking. Um, 
movie tires sometimes I think get spooked off the idea of really small threads. Uh, the truth is that these fibers are all so delicate and small that you need very little pressure to actually secure these fibers. Uh, with CDC or otherwise, we're just using such small amounts that strength isn't really um, uh, too important when it comes to dry flies. It's more about uh, just managing your bulk. Is that it's important? So we've got a wing in here. You can see it, it's pretty long. This is a size 14. It's a pretty big, long wing. But how this fly is going to ride in the water is something kind of like this. Let's show my depth here. Something like that. And so the fish are going to see it from beneath. Now, and they're just going to see this little speck with just a wing sticking up. Or maybe I'll see it canted off slightly. And the wing size isn't going to come into play too much. But um, it, it will make it way easier to see, way more buoyant. Um, and yeah, and actually it will encourage a softer landing as well. It's one thing that you'll hear me come back to a few times is that having a bit of a, a taller, fluffier wing um, will help sort of kill the speed on the fly through cast. So if you're um, casting and you, know, you come down like a little too steep on the, the angle, you're casting too close to the water and you've got less speed on the fly, it's going to crash really hard. It's not going to look much like a, not much like a mayfly, an emerging mayfly, definitely. Maybe it would work fine for a beetle or a hopper that gets blown into the water. But most flies are pretty delicate on the surface. And so if your fly comes racing in there and smacks hard, um, not only can it sink your fly, but it also looks unnatural. So having a big, tall wing, it's like a parachute. It uh, catches a lot of air and sort of dissipates that energy and helps it fall more gently. So nice plus there, too. Yeah, Mark, yeah, this is a be precise. It's a 14 I'm tying on, but this is a, uh, a Hannock 130. That's why I tie most, most of my just standard dry flies on. That or the Dirty 301. It's a pretty similar hook. Um, really nice hook. I wouldn't tie this really much bigger than a, uh, a 14, maybe a 12 here and there. Um, but then all the way down to an 18. For sure. I'm going to take my thread back, just about to the bend here, and then we're going to grab some pheasant tail, some natural pheasant tail. And really key with dry flies, maybe not all dry flies, but certainly many flies, is sparseness. So um, urine infant has certainly become very, very popular in recent years. And um, I think a lot of folks are familiar with the idea of a paradigm, just a slim bodied nymph that's going to cut through the water and sink really well. But also, um, uh, it has to do with just how natural it is. If you look at bugs, bugs are tiny little things with very frail um, uh, bodies overall. And uh, fly tires like to go a little overboard, myself included, sometimes and get things uh, a little thicker than they should be. So, um, yeah, we've also realized the benefits of that in urine and things, but especially with mayflies, which are very thin bodied flies, um, you really want to try and keep things down to not always a minimum. You need some um, some bulk there sometimes, otherwise it's just a hook. But uh, try and keep it to a minimum. So this is only three pheasant tail fibers here. You could maybe go up to four. I wouldn't go heavier than that. You see I've tied them in by the tips. So it's the thinnest ends that I've tied them in by. And I'm just gonna wrap them up the hook here. I'm not even gonna be very careful about making sure that thread doesn't show through. Um, part of the idea with this fly, this fly is tied uh, by a guy named uh, Jeremy Lucas. He's um, an English iron angler, well, a competitive angler. Um, and his thing is that um, bugs a lot of the time have, have like an olive tinge to them, even if they aren't really an olive bug. I uh, think of it, um, uh, Ian Martin explained this in a class that we had at the shop a couple years back too. Uh, if you ever think of you know, driving down the road in the summer and you, um, you hit a bug and your, your windshield ends up being kind of greeny yellow, <laughs> the, uh, the fluid of, of a lot of bugs end up, uh, the innards are kind of a greeny yellow a lot of the time. And so um, you know, when light shines through them, it would make sense that there's just a little bit of that shining through. So that's the reason for the olive thread. And then what we're actually going to do is something that some people might abandon the stream over me doing is just take that thread down and back through our body. So now you can see there's a little bit of olive uh, showing pretty, pretty blatantly on top of that body. 
Now it's going to reinforce our, our uh, pheasant tail here. This pheasant tail is pretty brittle on its own, so even the small teeth of trout can get in there and rip it up pretty easily. But it um, also just really accentuates the, the olive kind of coming through there. So it looks really good when it's wet. It looks a little weird when it's wild. And then just for the thorax, to give the impression of, you know, legs and, you know, budding wing case and all that good stuff up at the thorax, uh, in that area at least. Um, what I've got here, this is a CDC dubbing from HEMS. Um, you can just use, shoot up like CDC, like the shirts earlier. I've got um, just a sort of meh feather here. So I can do with this if you want. It's just, it's a super sparse, I'm trying to say. It's just rip off some fibers. So, just a pinch of loose fibers. I'm just going to dub them out of my thread. I think that's the best use for your sort of lesser quality CDC. But you can also just buy CDC dubbing, which is just chewed up CDC. I'm just going to wrap this behind the wing here. See, I didn't dub that very tightly at all. A lot of dry flies. Uh, people are looking to create these really tight dubbing noodles that keep like a nice thin body, which is fine when you're talking about the abdomen stretch, uh, because again, that is usually pretty thin. When you're talking about your thorax here, especially on sort of an emerging bug like this, where um, if you ever see an emerging bug on the water surface, there's a lot going on. You know, there's parts of the bug being shed off and new parts um, uh, just kind of coming to life and springing out of, of the, uh, the mental shock. Um, there's just a lot happening. They're pretty scruffy looking. They aren't very neat looking. So having sort of a loosely dead thorax here, just legs and stuff going on, is, uh, is actually a nice look. And then the last thing that we'll do is, you notice on that second to last wrap here, so I'm wrapping the dubbing on, and I'm going to actually just hop in front of the wing and bring the thread up. So now I'm just going to, by the eye, you'll recall that I left just a little bit of space up there. I'm just going to wrap wraps in there just in front of that uh, CDC just to kind of pop it up a little bit and now I get this bug kind of sitting not like a straight up parachute where it's a shell cut, so not parachute, uh, where it's sitting straight up and down but rather it's going to sit like that so it just gives that fish a little bit more of the profile of the bug instead of seeing it from straight below where it's just a speck they're seeing that so it's just a little bit of a different look. Um, I don't know if this matters too, too much. But I think it does look good. Um, we'll look finish in front there, and that is a really good fly. Um, also works well, like kind of smaller sizes as like mid locations. So if you're on, say, the grand, you know, you've got midges popping off, tie this in a smaller size, then it's like uh, an 18 or so. And, um, even if the, the bugs, the natural, are smaller, an 18 is going to be a really small imprint on the water surface. So I think most days that probably be sufficient to film yourself down too much smaller. And you can just take a little bit of Velcro and brush out that thorax or even a little bit more if you want to make it super leggy. So yeah, really good mayfly or midge um, sort of a merger. A uh, great fly just to sort of prospect with, throw around. If there are any bugs around, um, fish are rising at all. This is a, a really good standby one. So that's the plume tip. As you mentioned for still water, I will tie it a little bigger sometimes too, like even up to uh, four, or sorry, up to a 12 sometimes. Um, just on still water still, I haven't done that much in rivers. So that's number one for you. Here's my box of goes. If you guys have anything you want to see, like I say, I'm just, I don't really have a lesson plan this morning. I'm just kind of talking. I'm filling my own boxes, so if you guys have a technique that you want to see, by all means, throw it in there. All right, let's see what can we do next. What a cat's let's do that. We'll stay on the CDC uh, bandwagon here. I'm going to do a, a nice simple CDC caddis, which uh, looks something kind of like that. It's polar opposite of our, our little mayfly merger there. It's super scruffy, chunky. It's the way you like caddis. 
So this is, um, I see a lot of different variants here, CDC caddis, or color variants on the, uh, the plume chip marking. Um, I don't really tie any. Um, you certainly could. Um, yeah, not, not, not to say you couldn't play around with it, but I just don't. I just tie that one. <laughs> so maybe an olive. An olive could look nice, or like even a, um, I've got like some yellow pheasant tail, which is actually more of a yellow olive. That, that could look kind of cool for some stuff, I guess. But uh, no, I really just tie the natural on that one. So CDC caddis. Um, great thing about CDC when it comes to caddis is that it really lends itself well to the ring profile of the caddis. So um, if you guys think of like what an elk hair caddis looks like, you know, the most commonly fish um, caddis patterns, it's got that squared off wing. If you look at a caddis in, in nature, it, it's kind of like that too. It's kind of this triangular shaped bug. Um, it's got these tented wings over the back, which end up having a sort of triangular profile, and they're pretty square off the back. So this, much like the elk hair does in an elk hair caddis, gives you just a perfect uh, my mind um, wing program. Uh, caddis, I mean, if you haven't really taken a, a good look at them, it'll look a little like a moth almost. So most people can sort of picture a, a moth in fact, you know, again, similar kind of profile to that. So this stuff works great for that. Uh, you guys have to excuse me for one minute because I forgot to plug in my laptop here. It is running low on juice. Now uh, one sec. All right, we're good. Cool, so let's hop into this. So there's a bunch of different ways you can do this. Uh, the way I feel on mine is I'll go back and I'll just see the little CDC dubbing again. So uh, this again is just a 14 hook, same hook, same 130 hammock. Um, time and whatever size your local caddis are. So for, for Ontario, that's a lot of like, you know, 14, 16, maybe some 18s. Uh, Get some smaller like black caddis and stuff all the way down to 20s, but um, you know, so your core sizes. So, again, you can just get this dubbing from ripping apart a little bit of a CDC feather. We're going to dub this a little tighter than we did on the uh, relaxing the plume tip just because this is the body of the caddis. So, caddis again, if you just picture sort of a moth profile, um, similar kind of look. So, really scruffy, buggy, not an elegant thin body bug, but the abdomen stretchy is still uh, generally a little thinner than, um, than the head. So we don't want to go crazy with the body here, but we don't have to be really tight about it either. So I'm just going to wind a decently sized so kind of rope of this stuff up until maybe just past the halfway mark. I'm not sure if that's quite two thirds or not, but up and around there at least. Like that. Okay. That's a body. You could use uh, hair's ear dubbing for that too. It works really well. For the wing, <clears throat> again, that'll be CDC, of course. Um, let's find a couple feathers here. My, my caddis, I like to go a little heavier on, especially up in this kind of size range up on the 14s. Um, so I'll find two feathers here. Good <clears throat> my bag, CDC there. Should mention as well, we're, uh, we've got some CDC at the shop right now, but we are a little low. We have a ton of CDC coming in uh, hopefully next week sometime, so very short. Yeah, we covered. So I've just taken this time two good full CDC feathers, one and two, and I'm just going to pair them up so that they, uh, they just have the tips lined up like that. And then again, we'll just bundle all those fibers together. Like so, and tie that over the top. I go just like a little bit past the, uh, the bend of the hook, somewhere back there. And I'm just gonna make like a, 
I want to keep these things pretty well centered on top to keep advantage of that, that profile. Kind of just kind of flat. So, so I want to keep them centered there. So I'm just going to again, pinch them tight. Like a nice soft wrap. Come up tight. More good tight wraps. We're tying in the stems of CDC. That is the one downside of the stuff is that you can see it's a survey. We use that feather, but you can just see how thick the stem can get on some of these things, depending on the feather. But these stems are really stiff and they're pretty slippery uh, to tie in. So if, you, if you're concerned about the overall position of your CDC, like the last fly we weren't really, as long as it's sticking out straight, we didn't care about which angle it was turning. Um, this one we do care. So just make sure it's really locked down there. Again, you don't need a really strong thread for that. You just need uh, you know, a, a decent number of wraps. So snip off. Another thing that you will really appreciate having, I guarantee you, if you're serious about time dry flies, is like just a really good fine tip pair of scissors. So these are the razor scissors. These are the Dr. Smith ones, but they're the balloon ones and the brands. Um, or the poppers are really nice. Just something with a really good fine tip to it makes not so much this fly or the last one, but some of these flies that we're going to have makes it a lot easier to get good clean cuts and tight spaces. So I'm just going to tidy this up a little bit. I probably could have taken my body actually a little further forward before tying in that way, but it's fine. Next up, we are going to do something that some people might not find as much fun, and you don't have to do it this way. But this is the way I like to do it, is a double loop, or a split thread loop, depending on the size of the fly and whether it makes sense. The size we should be able to get away with double loop easy enough, so. Just in the interest of making it easy on myself, we're gonna do that. What you wanna do is find yourself another CDC feather with really good long fibers to it, something like that. And to make this loop, just like any other double loop, so we'll just take our thread, don't make it all that big, but make it, you know, a few inches, tie it down, uh, to wrap my thread around that loop at the time, it's just to serve anchor, keep those legs thread together. I've got a loop here, double twister, pop that in there. You'll want to use a bit of wax for this. You don't need to use the super crazy sticky uh, stuff that you see out there, just like your regular old gutting wax, standard stick, the low tax wax, or whatever. Um, that's all you need for this. Just touch it up a little bit. And um, I have done this in the hand before, but a much easier way to handle the CDC is using these guys. Um, it's like a, a double flip. So these made famous by Mark Pettijohn. Uh His stuff is very hard to find in North America these days. Uh, these are made by Stonefall and do the exact same job. Um, so it's, yeah, it's basically just a clip, but it's got a nice smooth edge all the way through and uh, the clear so you can see how far down the CDC is actually sitting here. And all you want to do with them, they come in sets of two, so I just, I just two. Pedagon's system had like a, a tool that would allow you to fold this feather in half to double up all the, all the fibers together. Uh, I just use two clips. Five it does just fine. So I come to I open up the clip, I come top down on the feather. So leave yourself some room on the base of those fibers. Now I'm just going to come in, I'm just going to cut carefully all those fibers off. Back in. It's uh, so not that good grasping all those fibers. And then, like I said, these things are sold in sets of two, so that makes it easy. I just need the second clip the other side. Like so. So we go back to our dubbing loop here. This is a good opportunity, by the way, if you want to tie, tie in like a, a cider, so you know, something to help you see the fly. You can do it at this stage over the top, a little bit of like, um, like a little bright yarn or something, or a floss rather. 
So I'm just gonna open up that loop in my fingers and I'm going to feed in those fibers out of our clip. That's the one there, I just release. Now I've got a whole bunch of CDC in here. I'm just going to now kind of bunch that up and push it toward the front. So just to give myself space to get this second bundle in here and I can play around with the distribution of it. It's going to be the same thing. And because you have the wax on there, you can actually take a lot of pressure off this loop and those fibers aren't going to fall out. There we go. So, got basically a whole big feather of the CDC in this loop. Let's try and kind of evenly spread out these fibers here. I'm going to give that a good spin. And this is 14 out thread, so you can't spin it too tight. But again, you know, these are very delicate materials that don't require a lot of pressure to tie them down tightly. Um, so don't think that you have to really ratchet up that loop to make it work. I don't need any kind of heavy pick or anything I find to get these fibers freed up. I'm just kind of poking out with my fingers. I can get most of them freed up, enough at least, to what I'm doing. And I would just look for it a little bit. Start wrapping here. You know what? I said it wasn't going to bug me. The fact that my ring was a little far forward, but it is. So, see if we can. Be a little sneaky about this. Yes, I'm wasting two CDC feathers by doing that, but I'm not happy with flying, not going to fish it because something silly is that it's good. So I'm just going to backtrack a little here, a little more of that CDC job in the top. room is just too far back. That's better. Now. And we'll find two new CDC phones now. I promise you this is a much easier fly to tie if you just get that right the first time. Yeah, I'm getting that. Can I twist it a little? See if I can pick that up and see. Again, uh, caddis are really known for being pretty unkempt looking. They're really just very clumsy looking bugs. They're all over the place. I don't think this needs to be really tidy. I much prefer a really scruffy looking caddis. I would say that little save is worth it. Again, you could just as easily do a uh, split thread loop on that if you want to keep it a little tidier. But because we're using such a thin thread, we can get away with using the double loop. Um, 
in some ways it's a little simpler. So take a pick on the really small sizes. If you want to tie this even down to like a 20, um, I would go split thread loop. Or here yeah, you can tie this at the beginning of the close. You can actually just, um, once you've tied in the wing, tie, uh, or not tie rather, but uh, dub some CDC onto your thread very loosely and dub the head and just pick it out. And you won't get these really nice long legs off of it, um, but it will give you a pretty good profile all the same. That's a CDC caddis again. Just really scruffy, not a lot to it. Very bland looking. I like guess it's, it's just a purely beige fly. If you wanted to mix in, you know, uh, be an olive body or a black body or whatever to match the color of the caddis around you. Sure. Definitely can add a cider if you want. Um, there's a lot of twists on this pattern out there that you'll see. Some guys will even put uh, on top of your CDC wing a little bit of elk hair to help with the buoyancy if you want to, use it to suspend like a dry dropper, that could be an option, or if you're fishing really turbulent water. Sure. Uh, this is the version I fish most. I, I will tie some with the side of some of uh, That's a really good one to have in the box. It doesn't sit super high like an elk hair, if I like. Um, it sits high enough, you can still skate it if you want. You can make it dance out there. Um, you can also extend the water logging it, but um, it just it's, it sits a little more naturally, I think, than uh, full-blown like elk hair caddis that's just really high up in the water. Alrighty. Well, we've done multiple CDC classes before, so we should probably mix it up a little bit. So let's do something with a hackle. Again, I'll just keep on the size 14s here, just to make it easy to see for you guys. And for anyone just joining as well, I am open to requests. So I'm just at my bench at home. And I've got probably anything I need to tie. If not exactly the fly that you want to see, at least a version of it. So. Um, yeah, let me have it. See what I can do. I'm gonna switch up my thread color here. Not because it really matters, but uh, I think I could just like a black thread on the easy little bit. I'm actually dropping down to this is a 60 knot black thread now. Um, I don't think you need 16 knot for tying on a 14 hook. I think you could do a 14 or maybe even 12, just fine. It's just what I had nearby. And again, these thinner threads are, if anything, just easier to work with. So there's really no downside to it. And we'll just do like a little riff on an Adams here. Um, this is a fly that I do really like. I do fit more CDC than anything else. But um, having a few hackled flies in the box is not a bad idea. So, so it's, it's basically an Adams, but also not. Uh, for the tail of this thing, this is just some cocktail on here. You can use the classic um, you know, grizzly and brown tackle fibers. It'll do basically the same thing. This uh, CDL is just kind of speckled brown anyways, so you get kind of Best of both worlds, everything in it. And I'm just going to strip off all like, the softer fibers from the bottom and get these, these more prickly, stiffer ones to see if we're going to float better for us. I'm going to take, you know, this is a big hook. I'm going to take really good into these things. I'm not going to really do a guess how many fibers that is, but like, yeah, a good solid bench, maybe even a few more. I'm just going to try and kind of roughly line up the tips again. Sitting nice and straight there. For tail length, we're going to go about as long as the body here. And you notice I didn't bother making touching wraps or anything going down the shank. Again, that's a great thing about 16 knot thread, is it's so thin that you don't really need to put in quite so much effort in touching a little long. And you'll notice as I'm trying this in, I kind of pull up on these tail fibers as I wrap back, just to try and keep them on top of the hook, keep them from rolling around on me. 
move targets very soon, so I'm not really worried about them creating that bulk. I'll just cut them short and I think by the time then length the shrink or anything. <clears throat> That's not bad. I feel like it could actually use a few more fibers here. So. I've been trying a lot of really small stuff lately, and so I think I'm maybe even getting a little too conservative with uh, some of my materials here. Yeah. You can muck around with that too. You can tie like um, more densely tied flies, like with here, flies and sparsher ones in the same pattern just to suit your needs. So, like finding really slow water, a sparsher fly is probably going to be preferable to, to something um, really bushy, but. That also probably won't float very well in uh, a really fast current. So, walk around with it. I'm going to tell you, this is a, can be a parachute atoms. And what I'm going to use for this, this is a, a glow bright, uh, this is the yarn, not the floss, but the yarn in a 16, which is just white. Um, the white yarn is quite visible. It's got like a nice sheen to it, so it does seem to be pretty easy to see from a range. And for this size, yeah, what I'll do is I'll just take a, a length of stuff a few inches long. I'm just going to double it over on itself. Yeah. Just trying to eyeball, see how dense I want this post. I should show a few fibers like that. I'm going to take my thread up. I like to do this before I do the body, just so it's already set and I don't have to muck around with things in a really tight space after I've done the body. So. I like to do my post first. Um, so I'm gonna double over that, that bit of yarn there, like so. And then I'm gonna double it over my thread once again. I'm tying this in, you know, a couple millimeters, a couple solid millimeters back from the eye. I wanna give myself space to it. I could, I want to be nice to myself, make that a little longer, easier to handle. No harm in doing that. This for some reason didn't feel like doing it. So there we are. So all I've done, so I'm skipping ahead here without explaining. I've tied this just down on top. Like that very well centered on top. And now all I'm going to do is I'm going to take my thread, short enough my thread to start with, so it's just easier to work with. I'm going to wrap it around the base of that post. And the problem that people usually run into. And they're doing that is this. They're trying to wrap a bunch of nice wraps on, and then oops, it slipped. Oop, two wraps slipped off, and sometimes you just lose it. So, what I like to do is, you know, while gripping that post, get a few decent wraps on there, and then put one around the hook. And that'll just kind of anchor those wraps in place, keep the, um, them from slipping off the, the top of the post there. And Key to tying a good parachute. If you aren't familiar with what a parachute is, it's pretty simple. Um, it's kind of half in front of me, but I missed it. Close it is. So, what we're going to do on this is we're going to take a half up and we're going to be wrapping it around this post like this. So that our, our leg, the half of it, I think of it, is sitting sort of parallel to the shank of the hook. It's not standing up and down. So, that again allows the fly just to sit. You know, closer and tighter to the surface of the water, give you a more natural impression. And in order to be able to wrap it around the post, you need to firm that up a bit. Um, and so that's why we can't access the thread wrench. Otherwise, you're just not going to have a firm enough or stable enough surface to get that back along. So once you have a couple initial wraps on there, one thing that makes it a lot easier uh, to really solidify is using, you can use different glues, but a little bit of head cement or um, rather uh, super glue. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to take the, the super glue and I'm just going to it's a lot of super glue. I'm just going to line my thread with it. Thin coat of this super glue here. And then you can either just carefully make wraps around, like so, or if you have a rotary vise like I do, turn the fly outside, pivot the vise. Try to keep this in focus for you guys. That. And then, while looking head on at your fly, so I'm looking head on at the fly, I can then just wrap as I normally would around the hook, just around my post. So hopefully it comes through what I'm doing here. Or you can just stand it up as you would normally. And wrap. 
And I'm just dropping gently here. You don't need to put much pressure on it because that. Um, the head cement is going to do all the firming up that we need. So I don't need to really pull tight. I just need to get the glue on there. And that'll really firm things up. And I've got a little crazy to glue here. Yeah, that's fine. So now that's going to be a really firm, stable platform. Best to tie on here. And there's a lot of material you can use for posts. So I you want know, to get really old school with it. Turkey flats. Um, you can use. Um, all kinds of different yarns. You can use uh, calf tail if very commonly used. But the thing about um, that for one, turkey flats just aren't very um, dense, so that they're I think a little harder to make a uh, a good solid platform with. And when it comes to calf tail, like you see in a lot of flies, it's just bulky, and like tying it in requires you to tie it down on the shank first and then up. And uh, it creates a really bulky body. So the great thing about yarn in my mind is that you can keep just a really thin body profile without sacrificing this. A lot of flies you see on Instagram with beautiful um, alternate materials to create posts, but then they end up with these really bulky bodies and they look fine on Instagram, but they don't fish all that well. So I'd much rather take this. If the body on this, um, you can go all kinds of different ways, but again, we're going to stay more or less true to Adam's form. So, let try and put it up. Original style from Oscar Adler. This is just a, a hair's ear that in here. So we'll just use a little hair's ear. And I'll show you another trick. It's kind of a cool effect when you're doing these, not just parachutes, but any dry fly with dubbing. Is that I'm going to start my thread up at the post here. I'm going to start dubbing this. Here's your dubbing on there. Keeping it really thin. This is where a lot of people struggle when they're starting with dries. I'm using that much, let's see, that much dubbing on my thread at a time. It's a very sparse amount. You can always add more. It's partially about maintaining the profile. Well, it's, sort of, it's all about maintaining the profile. But sparse amount of dubbing will help um, just being less um, in controlling the profile, but it'll also let you dub your dubbing on much tighter than you would be able to with a, a large clump of dubbing. So even if you have to add more over top of it, you'll end up with a tighter round dubbed body. So with that on my thread, I'm just going to start it up just behind the post here. And if you fancy, you can just um, strategically dub more dubbing towards the top and less as you go down the thread to create a nice taper as you run back. Or you can just kind of dub it flat and you know, just even down your, your thread here, put a couple extra wraps in front, and then taper it down by even less overlapping wraps as you get back. Maybe I'll write it on and I might have gone a little heavy. Again, some bugs you can get away with, the fish are eating the caddis or you know, stone fly or something. There's not much downside to using a, a chunkier uh, body fly, but if there are may flies, they can be pretty darn picky, and, and bushy flies just don't look the part. So if you have a little dubbing at the end, you can pick it off. One thing about hazy dubbing is sometimes you get them. Guard hairs that are sticking up, even if you dub, if you dubbed it tightly. So if you want to clean that up, you can just come in and cut those off. But the reason that we dub this front to back and not back to front, as we usually would, is that now what I can do is I can take my thread and use it to actually rib the fly. I'll just start sort of spiraling wraps up through the body and maybe. Let's space them out a little further as I get forward. And I might be a little hard to see on camera. I posted a photo on my feed earlier, though, showing this up close, but you can see how that creates a cool segmentation kind of effect. I doubt that really affects the um, performance of the fly, but it does help tighten, that, tighten down that body even a little further. Right there. So we're up here. And now to where we get to play the pocket. So, if you haven't played around with hack before, it's really key that you get good dry fly quality hack. 
and there's different types and different brands. Uh, Whiting is a terrific one. That's what this is. Uh, there are other good ones out there too. But um, there are two main types when we talk about hackles. It's all from roosters. There are saddle hackles, which look like this. They're really long, thin feathers. And then there are capes or necks, which have shorter feathers. Still pretty thin, but they're a little shorter. And you'll see that toward the front, they're pretty fine and small. And as you get toward the back, they're actually quite large. And so the pros and cons to each. Uh, capes or necks, great thing is that you get a really broad range of sizes. Like down here, I get some really uber small stuff, and I get some really big stuff back here. But the downside is, as you can probably guess, is you run through your core sizes really quickly. As so you can see, I picked all like 14 and 16s off this, uh, this neck here. So yeah, you get a good range, but uh, not, you, you do run out of uh, your core sizes very quickly. Saddles, conversely, these are taken from the back of the bird and are much longer feathers. You can see they're pretty well uniform in size. Usually when you buy a saddle, you're buying like two to maybe three sizes of hackle, and they pretty well all fall in there. And even throughout one feather, you can see they're pretty well even all the way through. A little smaller toward the tip, a little bigger toward the, the base, but it's pretty well all the same. And so if the saddle you get to tie thousands upon thousands upon thousands of the same size fly, and so you're not gonna run out very quickly, but you're limited in the range that you get. So just something to consider, uh, depending on you know, if you're just kind of finding yourself fishing the same size flies all the time, or if you want to muck around with different stuff, uh, one might be better than the other. The keys to a really good dry fly tackle, and if you generally buy from a good breeder of these birds, then um, you're gonna find that they're pretty consistent. So this isn't stuff that you really have to concern yourself with too, too much when you're in shop looking at these things. But um, you, it is really key to get a good quality one. And what a good quality one means is a few things. One, they have pretty uniform barb length. So when I'm wrapping this half of it, I want those barbs to all kind of be the same length. You can imagine if it starts at one size and ends up completely different, it's not very useful because we're gonna need four, five, six wraps of tackle on a fly usually. Secondly, is you want something with really good barb density. So you can see the barbs are those fibers coming off the side of the feather. And you can see how many of them there are per inch, or per two inches, whatever, whatever inch and a half. It's really dense versus if I get um, with more of a fine streamer hackle, there's a, just a really you know, cheap kind of streamer hackle that we use for all kinds of you know, bass flies and things. You see how many fibers there are? Very good number, but it's not nearly as many as this. So when we wrap this on, you're gonna get a lot of fibers poking out, and those fibers are what's, uh, what are responsible for floating this fly, for displacing water and keeping it on the surface. And if it's really sparse, it's not gonna float very well. If it's nice and dense, for one, you're gonna need fewer wraps to achieve the same effect, um, meaning that you actually get more flies per feather but it's also going to displace water better and float better for it. Um, thirdly, is you need good stiff barbs. So these things are really prickly. And again, that's just to make sure that they, actually, they don't absorb water too well and they do stay you know, stuck outright and help displace water. Soft barb feathers don't, um, don't float well. And again, to serve us at that point, taking an inexpensive streamer grade stuff here, but just really soft and kind of wimpy, um, especially if you look at something like this, it's on a field line flapping. It, just, it doesn't have that uh, characteristic to it. So consistent sizing, barb density, barb stiffness, those are sort of the, the big things I would say on these things. Um, and again, if you get a good quality black fly neck or saddle, that would make the best sense for you. Uh, you're, you're almost certainly going to get that. But just a few things to think about there. If you can't afford this stuff, again, just tie CDC flies or tie healthcare flies. Or, um, there's a lot of options on the table besides hackle flies. You don't necessarily need to jump right into this. So I'm going to tie this in by the butt end of the feather, or the base of the feather. And so you can tell that end uh, because the fibers are flowing away from it, right? pointing down or up toward the tip. So I'm going to tie it in by this end. All I've done here is I've taken a few of the fibers, I've just kind of stripped them off to expose 
a bear stand there. I'm going to tie this in. Give yourself a good bit of room to work with, by the way. You can see I've created probably about a quarter inch of bear stem there, just to make it easier to tie in. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to set that down, tie it down along the hook to start with. So I'm not doing anything fancy, I'm just tying it down along the hook. Let that stem in a little bit. That is a pair of 160 hot thread. So again, you don't need to go the small flat on. Okay, there we go. Now, what we need to do is we actually need to tie this tackle in up the post. And the reason is that when we start wrapping it, we're gonna start at the top and we're gonna work our way down until we tie off everything at the bottom of the post. And so that, that's why it was really key to make uh, this post really nice and firm. And put some super glue on there and get nice and firm that for us to make it easier to tie, to tie around. So what you're gonna do now is you're gonna pull this tackle upwards and you can put some thought in as well on um, what orientation this hackle's in. Ideally, when we start wrapping, you want to kind of cupped upwards. I'm not sure what that looks like. It could be a little wider. So, when we wrap, ideally, you'd like the fibers of this hackle to point ever so slightly upwards. And see what that looks like. And the reason is that it just makes it easier to get wraps of thread underneath them without trapping fibers. If they're sort of sloped upwards, um, it'll just make it easier to, uh, to tie in. And so when you're tying it up the post, you can kind of keep in mind which way you're tying it in, which orientation it's in. You can kind of twist it to, to your liking there. If the feather starts um, the cup side away from you, I find it's, so if it's like, yeah, most tires can visualize this, but all feathers have like a, a concave kind of matrix in a convex nature, depending on which way you look at. So here's a big pheasant tail feather. You can see how that wants to curve upwards. So a hackle has that too, and if you can identify that side of it, then what I would say is make that cupped side face into the post, assuming you're tying this on the, the near side of yourself. And then when you start wrapping, it'll generally want to orient itself so it's sort of cupped upwards. Not super critical, I wouldn't say, to these flies. It's something to make the job a little easier for yourself if you want. So now I'm just tying this up post. I'll bring my thread back in. And then put it anchored around that uh, back up thing. So here we are. Again, and Adam's, uh, the original one has both a brown and a grizzly hackle. I'm a little too lazy for that usually, so I just grab my, my uh, grizzly hackle here. And grizzly is a cool color where you have this barred um, kind of coloration to it. There's a theory that um, having that barred, not barred look almost looks like movement. Uh, even when it's still, uh, fish can't seem, I guess, to, to really focus on uh, the bars and so it looks like things are coming in and out, moving around. Uh, it's an interesting theory. I don't know if it really holds water. But either way, I think anything barred looks natural, so it's a more important color to me. So I'm just going to start now wrapping this hackle around this post. And again, if you want to make this a little easier on yourself, you can turn the vise and face the fly toward yourself so you're just wrapping as you usually would. I'm just going to do it normally so you guys can see better. And I'm not going to go too heavy on this. Again, there's no real right or wrong uh, number of wraps to put on a fly. Four, I'm going to say that's probably about good. So to tie this off, I'm going to do now. I'm going to hold this out to the side. And now I'm going to take my thread and I'm going to start wrapping my thread around the base of that post again. Don't need my wraps, three, four wraps. And I'm going to 
clean my house a little back, get my thread in front of it again. Like so. Come in tight, snip off, and then get the half hole and then And then what we can do just to kind of tidy everything up is put a little bit of half hole just on the, uh, the thorax of the flying. You can do this before or after, I don't think there's a right or wrong way. So that, I'm going to use a little, a little more CDC action, just to give it, again, a little bit of scruff in the thorax. So, so, so put the pink CDC, like so. Rub it on. Medium tight. And now I'm just going to pull up all these hackles to get them out of the way. Most of the way. And sneak a few uh, wraps. Just in around the base of that post here. Just to tidy up any bare thread spots. And uh, make things a little more buggy. Something like that. And just have this left to flip away too far. And then come back down. So. And again, I'll just pull all those fibers back. On a quick, quick finish there. You can also whip finish, if you want to be fancy about it, on the post itself. That'd be where you tie in your thorax first as soon as you did the hackle. And, uh, and then as you wrap the hackle down, you would tie off the, uh, the hackle on the post, and then you'd actually whip finish around the post as well. And you can do that too. There's no way to it along at that point. Finally, you're just going to cut the post itself. The fish really don't see this. This is more for your good. So, a little bit of a taller post is again just easier to see. The downside to it. And that is, it's not really an Adams because we swapped out quite literally almost every material. But uh, it gives, gives you a pretty similar look to an Adams. Maybe more mosquito like, I guess, kind of thing. But just a really good general purpose, like maybe fly down pattern. And it kind of gives you the, the idea of how to do a parachute drive, or one way to do a parachute drive. So there's a few different ways of attacking it. Hopefully that helps. I didn't talk about uh, hackle sizing either, but um, again, either if you have a, a saddle, you can have limited in sizes, capes, you have locks. But uh, you know, good hackle sizing, generally on a parachute, going back to about the, the bend of the hook, I'd say is about right in around there. Too short, you're not going to get enough water displacement. Uh, too long, proportionally, everything just goes to hell. So it's kind of what you're looking at there. Again, I'll throw the question for those still hanging in there. I don't know how much longer we're going to go. I guess we're already up at about an hour. Um, if you guys want to see anything, let me know. I'm open to doing whatever. Otherwise, I'm just going to tie one more fly uh, here, another little emerger. And uh, we'll call it a day. I should note as well, I think Rob is going to do a stream a little later in the day, too. Uh, I have no clue what he's going to do it on, but uh, keep you guys good for that one. All right, so an emerger. This has become one of my absolute favorite flies. Um, okay, I'm going to try this one a little smaller than the others because I'm picking up size 16. So. Hopefully your eyes have warmed up. This is a really good fly. And I can't, I can't take credit for it, much like I can't really take credit for any of these things. This is shown to us by uh, some of the guys on the, uh, the Spanish team. And uh, definitely fly their invention, but it produces really well. So hook here, this is the Hannock 390. So this is the pink hammer hook. This is a size 18. I tie this like size 16, 18, even 20s. Um, to this sense, what it looks like. Yeah. 
that's what we're dealing with. It's just a little emerger. And then you see a really long wing on there. I might actually end up turning this one down on river. I like to leave my wing kind of long to start with and then adjust them as need be. But it's a devastatingly good fly. Um, you can call it like a little olive emerger, but I think it works for a pretty well animated fly. Definitely smaller ones at least. And the hook is really key. It's going to get this fly sitting mostly subsurface. And, um, and the wing is the other way. For the body, so this one I would say it's quite key that you have a really small thread. So I would be absolutely 16 on this thread. I wouldn't go big. I think you're going to struggle if you do. For the tail, you can use different things. I use a little bit of hair zero, like off a hairy mask. Um, you can also use like an antron or a silk or anything you like. But I just take. Actually, no, I'm going to be honest. This is the other, the, the other, other option is uh, this stuff. Here's your plus, which is basically just a mix of here's your and uh, and prime dubbing. I'm going to take a pinch out of the bag. This is way too much. What I'm going to do is I'm then going to pull away a few fibers, take hands, grab them, pull them out of these fibers until I'm pretty sure that what I've got is just a little clump of you know, more or less aligned fibers out of bag. So I've just sort of aligned uh, a group of those fibers so they all stick in straight alignment there. And because it's a very small pinch of fibers, you gotta be careful handling it. I'm just gonna take my thread down the bend here. And once I get, you know, just a millimeter or so away from, sorry, I'll be a better view here from um, really going around the bend. Pinch it in. Let's see just how short those fibers are. And then start wrapping it down the bend. You don't want to go too dense with this. This is just give the, uh, the sense of um, sort of shock of the fly being shed. Just like a little scruff off the back is all we really want. I'm just going to tidy up here, find down those loose fibers at the top. And there are different materials that you can use for the body of this. The one I just showed you is with a turkey quill, or turkey um, biot rather. Uh, you can also do this with a, um, um, sorry, I'm blanking here, a peacock quill, which is what I think I'm going to do here. On <laughs> Running low on these things. So, um, those are peacock quills. Do polish quills. And I don't advocate putting them in your mouth because there are dyes and things on them, but I'm going to do it just quickly. And the reason to do that is just to soften them up. So if they don't so they're quite brittle out of the package, if you just start wrapping them, they'll almost certainly break. The better way to do that would be to have just a, a bit of water at your station and skip them in water for a minute or so before starting. Um, but I'm going to make that sacrifice for you guys. So what you want to do is you want to tie this in by the tip, close to it. These are very brittle toward the tip, so be very careful of wrapping them around there. Um, the quill you'll notice sort of has I think you can kind of see that, a light and a dark egg. So the top of this feather, or this uh, fiber right now is uh, light, the bottom is dark. And that matters because when you wrap this, it's gonna create a little cool segmented body, but only if we wrap it the right way, otherwise it'll all just be one color. So the way that you wanna do it is you wanna have the black at the trail edge as you wrap, which means 
But if you're looking at it from the side, you actually want the black edge on top uh, as you time it in. Let's see if I get this right. So I've got to think it through in my head as I'm talking here, make sure I'm not spouting nonsense. <laughs> that should be the right way. So we'll just tie that down. Again, not super concerned about like, touching wraps just because this thread is so crazy thin. Now, to make this body more durable, you can put a little super glue down. I'm going to put a little UV over it at the end to help protect it. Um, so I'm not going to bother anything too fancy right now. But now that I've got that tied down, I'm going to start wrapping our quill forward. This stuff is pretty brittle, as I say. I didn't soak it very long though, so I'm quite soft enough to the book with. I'm really not putting any tension on it as I'm wrapping, especially to the tip because it's so brittle. I'm just wrapping it, not pulling on it. What you want to do is just kind of make edge to edge wraps. And actually, you can do make it a little easier on yourself you can use a hair, a hair of half of pliers. I almost never use half of pliers because it's one piece of just to hold it better. Again, putting almost zero pressure on this thing as I'm now. And you'll see as we start advancing it up the body here, that starts giving us a really cool, natural, segmented look. You don't have to be Quite so delicate once you start getting up rather right down toward the base. That's a little stronger down there. And you don't need to go all the way up to the eye. I'm going up to maybe the two thirds mark and just past that. Get three quarters mark there. You can see that it just gives you this really hyper realistic segmentation, which is pretty cool. Now, the only reason I was able to wrap that up is because I soaked it first. Uh, that one's dry, it will become super brittle again. So, to help protect it, this is uh, Solarize Bone Dry. It's uh, just a really thin viscosity uh, UV resin. So I'm just gonna take this, and I like the, the, the really thin resin just because it uh, doesn't, Blob up and add really any bulk to this body. It keeps it really nice and thin. It's just thick enough to protect it and nothing more. And that's really important when using UV resins on, uh, on dry flies, especially. UV is actually very heavy once it's cured, it adds a lot of weight to a fly. Um, if, in fact, like for, um, for still water fishing, for tying uh, buzzers or chronomics, whatever you want to call them. We will sometimes play around with them. Um, we'll have like um, UV cured bodies and, uh, and non UV cured bodies uh, just to have different weight options because it has a pretty profound impact on how quickly the thing sinks. So, this is a dry fly, we don't want anything to sink. We'd rather avoid that. So, um, get just something thick enough that's going to coat this body and really nothing more is what we want. Again, I see a lot of flies out there that are just dogged in UV and they aren't going to fish well, I can tell you, because of that. So you can use varnish for this too. Absolutely, you can just use like a head cement and that'll be a-okay. Maybe even lighter than the UV. UV is just convenient. So you can see I'm doing this mid-fly. You can imagine if um, if I was putting head cement or like wet glues on here, I'd be waiting to come back to the fly. That's good. It's cured. That's really durable now. It's, you know, encased under uh, under that resin. Nothing's going to get out that. So we get all the benefit of the segmentation. Now the downside of the brittleness of that uh, material. Cool. So now uh, we're going to go back to our trusty CDC. So this is one of my favorite flies. So shouldn't come as a surprise that it's pretty heavily based again on CDC. Actually, myself running kind of low on this stuff, so I've got to search for a good feather here. Bear with me.
Good D to flip. Okay. So you're on the bigger side. This again is an 18. No more than one good feather on an 18. Uh, no need for that. On a 16, again, depending on the quality of your feather, you might use two, maybe. Uh, but it's pretty, pretty small. You don't need to go with the feather. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie this in facing forward. Yeah, 18, actually, I can usually do that. I remind myself here. Yeah, we're going to tie it forward. Um, and I'm not going to tie it in right at the base. I'm going to tie it in based on the size of this feather. Up, maybe I'm done here. Now. Not super picky on the orientation of this feather. I can curve off the side a little bit once. But what I want to do is leave a little bit of space again before the eye. So I'm going to see that for those. Like a, a, another millimeter or so of space before the eye here. Hold that down well. Snip off the back there. So I've got this giant feather sticking off in front. One might actually end up doing this tiny on a uh, much sparser, smaller feather here. Because this isn't an awesome quality CDC pin I just put in. So I'll tie another. The not awesome one. This ends up being too bushy. I can always print it down. So, tie those two pins forward. Now, um, you can do a couple things. So for one, if you want a cider, this would be the time in my mind to tie it in. Um, so, for this, I'm using this is a this is kind of hard stuff to get done these days, but. This is Glow Bright number five. Uh, you can also use, it works pretty well, is pretty good here. Let's go. This is the Hands Neon Thread, which we've got the shop, and it's, uh, it's actually not too dissimilar from Glow Bright. It makes for a nice cider material if you can't get your hands on the Glow Bright. So I'm just doing is I'm just taking a small piece of that. I'm just going to double it over my thread, tie it directly on top of the hook, facing backwards. Now. Back to the bed. Okay. Make sure you have enough to, to get a hold of there. Go for a really tiny piece. Next up, we're going to go back to our CDC dubbing. I was definitely very small tension that stuff. Maybe a little bit more than a very small thing. Just a small thing. Okay. Just enough to build a, a tight little thread. So what you can actually do to keep this stubborn from sliding back is pull up on your cider material, drop in front of it to keep it from sliding back on you. Just enough to take us forward to where that CDC is tied in. And now what we're going to do is we're going to grab these two CDC plumes and grab them by their tips. And then I'm going to pull all the fibers off the sides of them. So you can see the two tips of the CDC plumes are here. That's what I'm holding right to. Then all the long fibers off the sides, I'm going to then separate out from the bunch. Leave no fiber behind if you can. And then I'm just going to grab them all and pull them back over the top of the fly. So I put a few wraps over them. Pushing them back and do it again. Okay. This is the fly. I mentioned a really good pair of scissors. Goes a long ways. Make sure all those fibers are really secure there. They're not going to slip out. And then come in and get that really good pair of scissors. Again, as tight as you can. I like to come from the side so I don't risk cutting my wing behind. Give them a whole step there. And that looks really crazy right now. It's going to become less crazy. The cider back here, what we're going to do with now is I'm going to 
come from above here, I'm going to kind of push this wing down and separate it into uh, it's not very uh, it's a big yeah. Um, so separate the wing into two equal parts, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that floss and I'm going to pull it through the wing forward. Like so and that's going to help pull those two wings out to the side there. And this is less to do with. Um, giving the fish the impression of two wings. They would kind of have that just with it out over the top like it was. Um, but what this will do is it'll sort of stabilize the fly and then thinking like a parachute, having a broader profile as the fly lands, will get to land more reliably straighter um, than if it was just sticking straight up. And I'll just take my floss now, just pull it back over the fly, and again tie it back in. So again, you can see how many wraps I've made of thread here right at the head. But because I'm using this really small thread, I can get away with it. So I'm using something thicker, I wouldn't be able to. Again, that side is way too long, so we're just going to come in and again, cut it fairly short. Just enough that you can see it, and not so long that fish are going to. And then we can just do a quick flip pan on the front here. This wing is a little long, so I'm gonna tear it down slightly. Just take all these and pinch. Just rip them down to a slightly more reasonable level. Again, the long wing is not something that fish are gonna see too much because they're seeing it from below the Celsius imprint above. And, uh, and it's gonna give you a much better landing, a much more reliable landing having the, the long wing there. So, um, if you really find fish for some reason don't like that long wing, you can always just tear it down on river. Uh, I like to leave them a little long, if anything, to uh, keep them in there. So that, that's your olive. Let's see if I can put this one on that. Yeah, yeah, good fly. So obviously it's not every dry fly ever created, that's not every style of dry fly, uh, but I do think that just with those few skills that we did say, you can tie pretty well any type of dry fly you want, meaning like any bug stage. Um, you can do a spinner, but that's pretty, pretty straightforward stuff. Um, hopefully this gives you enough to build off of and uh, enough to land with. And, like I say, I think Rob's going to come up with a stream a little later in the day, so keep your eyes peeled for that. I uh, hope everyone enjoyed, and maybe we'll do this again. Until then, have a good weekend.